Right now on Morning News Now, transition turmoil. This morning, President-elect Trump doubling down on his controversial pick for Attorney General Matt Gates. The now former congressman set to be the subject of an ethics committee meeting today after their investigation into allegations of drug use and sexual misconduct. There needs to be legitimate vetting. When, when I say legitimate, I mean just thorough vetting that the committees do. This is our job. All this as the president-elect names more members of his cabinet, plus a new push to postpone Mr. Trump's sentencing in that New York hush money trial. We have team coverage. Also this morning, an early winter is bearing down on parts of the West Coast as a powerful storm known as a bomb cyclone moves in. And back east, rain finally in the forecast. After weeks of dry weather, Angie is tracking it all. Plus, we have liftoff, major developments in America's mission to put mankind back on the moon. And Wicked Ways, we're just two short days from the highly anticipated Wicked movie musical. But already fans are fighting over a habit that's, well, popular. So is it okay to sing along to your favorite songs at the movies? We will break down the debate that has some moviegoers flying off the handle. Okay, as I think you all at home know, as Joe certainly knows, I'm not much of a musical person but i was lucky enough to see wicked i yeah, am obsessed you loved it the songs are stuck in my head that's good i keep checking spotify for the soundtrack i'm like what's happened to me well there is the original soundtrack you can watch yeah, <laughs> from, from the know, broadway but show i'm, like, I, I'm into the broadway this one, shows. you know and Got like right. cynthia did some that's like good. cool kind of unique things with her very good by the way to that debate there's only one answer to the question which and we is, will delve into that absolutely not you do no not singing sing in a theater, i agree with that well i mean i, I would never do that my voice is terrible but good to have you with us i'm joe fryer and i'm savannah sellers we're going to begin this morning with the president-elect's personal push to drum up support for his cabinet picks as some of them face an uphill battle in getting confirmed. An official from Donald Trump's team tells NBC News Mr. Trump is, quote, heavily working the phones trying to talk to Republican senators on behalf of his controversial pick for Attorney General Matt Gates. It comes as the House Ethics Committee is set to weigh whether to release a report that details their investigation into the former Florida congressman over allegations of sexual misconduct and illicit drug use. Last night, Trump's Deputy Chief of Staff, Stephen Miller, doubled down on the idea of bypassing the normal Senate confirmation process in order to push these nominations through. If there are some cabinet appointments that become troublesome, will the president use the recess appointment process? Yes. The president has won a mandate, and he will use all lawful constitutional means to fulfill that mandate on behalf of the people who voted for him in record numbers. We have full team coverage. You break it all down for us. Danny Savalos and Dasha Burns are standing by with new developments in Mr. Trump's hush money case and the latest on his cabinet picks. But first, let's go to NBC's Bree Jackson in Washington. The House Ethics Committee meeting to discuss whether to release the findings of its investigation into President-elect Trump's selection for Attorney General, former Congressman Matt Gates. Mr. Trump is standing firmly behind his choice, despite allegations that Gates engaged in illicit drug use and sexual misconduct. Are you reconsidering the nomination of Matt Gates? No. How far are you willing to go to get him confirmed? Some lawmakers want the bipartisan panel to release its report to senators before the confirmation process. It's critical. If his nomination is going forward, we want to make sure that we have access to the right documentation. There needs to be legitimate vetting. When, when I say legitimate, I mean just thorough vetting that the committees do. This is our job. This is the role of advice and consent. Vice President-elect J.D. Vance heading to Capitol Hill today to rally support for Gates and Trump's selection for Defense Secretary Pete Hegseth, who faced a sexual assault allegation in 2017, but no charges were filed. With those cabinet picks facing sharp criticism, the president-elect announced TV personality Dr. Mehmet Oz as his choice to head the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Oz ran for Congress in 2022, losing to Senator John Fetterman. He's not my first choice, and certainly Trump was definitely not my first uh, so here, here we are, and we're going to have to work with these individuals. Trump also selecting former pro wrestling executive Linda McMahon as his pick for education secretary. 
And the House Ethics Committee has several options when members meet in private today. They include voting to publicly release a report or passing it along to senators. Transition officials say they know that Trump's pick for Attorney General Matt Gates is the toughest confirmation they will have to fight for by far. Savannah, Joe. All right, Bree, thank you so much. Well, for more on the president-elect's cabinet picks, let's bring in NBC News correspondent Dasha Burns. Dasha, good morning. So Trump's team seems well aware of how difficult it will be to confirm Matt Gates for attorney general. What are they saying about this, and what more can you tell us about today's meeting of the House Ethics Committee? Well, look, Savannah, President-elect Trump and his team, they show no sign of backing down here. You mentioned he's personally calling senators to try to push them into confirming Gates. This is a pick, the DOJ, that's really important to him on the campaign trail. This is the top agency that he railed against. He felt that the DOJ was weaponized against him. And so he feels particularly that it's important to install someone in this role that's going to be loyal. And for him, that's Matt Gates. All right, let's talk about the newest cabinet picks during the campaign. We know the president-elect talked about eliminating the Department of Education. Well, now he has tapped Linda McMahon to lead that department. She's a longtime supporter of the president-elect. She served in his previous administration, the Small Business Administration, used to be CEO of the WWE. So what does she bring to the table in this role? And then also talk about any other new potential nominees. Longtime supporter and a mega donor, Joe, as well to Trump. She put about 20 million plus of her own dollars behind him this election cycle. And she doesn't have a ton of experience with education. She was uh, sitting on the Connecticut Board of Education uh, for about a year, 2009, 2010. Um, but she is very much on board with the Trump view of the Department of Education. He wants to dismantle it. He wants to uh, bring education into the state, sort of diffuse and decentralize the Department of Education. There are some things that he can do very quickly as well to uh, turn back some of Biden's initiatives. For example, uh, the student loan debt cancellation, that's something that uh, can be nixed pretty quickly. Same with Title IX protections for LGBTQ students, uh, he can do pretty quickly. And they are looking to implement universal school choice and again, uh, leave all of that to, to the states, Joe. Well, all this is going on, Dasha, talk to us about the moves Senate Democrats are trying to make before they have to give up power at the end of the year. I know we have some reporting here. Yeah, the big push is judicial confirmations. They're trying to put as many lifetime appointees on the bench as possible. Republicans are actually trying to stand in the way of that. They're trying to slow down the process, gum up uh, the system there. Uh, but that is the number one priority for, for Democrats in these final days of the Biden administration. Dasha, thank you very much. Sentencing in President-elect Trump's hush money case could be delayed again. Mr. Trump was convicted earlier this year on 34 felony counts of falsifying business records related to hush money payments made to adult movie star Stormy Daniels. That was before the 2016 election. Yeah, yesterday, the office of Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg told the judge in the case that his sentencing should be postponed while Mr. Trump's lawyers file further legal arguments. That's expected to include a motion to have the case dismissed. Judge Mershon was scheduled to sentence Mr. Trump next week, but that was thrown into doubt in the wake of his election victory and a Supreme Court ruling on presidential immunity. Joining us now to talk more about this, NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos. Danny, good to have you with us. We are in uncharted waters again. I feel like we say that a lot, but here we have a president-elect waiting to be sentenced. First of all, explain to us why prosecutors are pushing to try and have this sentencing delayed. Because it's going to happen anyway, and why not look magnanimous? And, for example, I could say to you, Joe, I have no objection to the sun setting in the West this evening. It's really the same thing, and the prosecutors uh, are saying as much in their papers. They're saying, look, even if there's a decision that comes out, there's going to be an appeal, and the sentencing is going to get adjourned one way or another. Adjournment is just a legal word for delayed, pushed off, rescheduled. And it's going to happen, so we might as well agree to it now. But... Hmm. Make no mistake about it, the New York uh, prosecutors are going to object, they're going to oppose these motions to dismiss the case. And for them, they probably concluded that, look, whether the sentencing happens now or it happens after Trump's term, it's a win for us either way, as long as the case is still alive then. So walk us through the possible scenarios here and I guess what's most likely. Like, could this continue to be delayed until even after he's president? Do you think anything happens before he is sworn in? Yes, it could be dismissed before he's sworn in. And now that he's been elected, Trump has at least 
two opportunities, two flips of the coin with the judge. Remember that he filed a motion to dismiss the entire case after the Supreme Court's immunity decision, mm -hmm. not based on the idea that somehow paying off adult film stars is official presidential action. That's not the gist of the motion. Mm -hmm. Instead, it's that the New York uh, Manhattan DA's office used evidence from his time in the White House. And the Supreme Court suggested that even evidence coming from the White House during a presidential term may be inadmissible. So they're saying they, the Manhattan DA's office may have used bad evidence. Now that he's been elected, they have a separate argument, which is that a sitting president cannot be jailed, and a president-elect is already engaged in presidential activities, so you can't sentence him, you can't sentence him to community service, he can't pick up trash on the side of the road with a yellow vest, can't do any of those things. Therefore, the case must be dismissed. So the case could be dismissed, mm. uh, or sentencing could, in theory, be pushed beyond the election. And I think the prosecutors are viewing that as well. Look, we're not going to get sentencing between now and the inauguration. We've, we're the only criminal case to get a conviction. If he's sentenced in 2029, so be it. That's our best chance, because mm. this case could go away. Mm. Let's talk about the Georgia election interference case that mm. is still out there, but an appeals court canceled a hearing set for December 5th discussing whether to continue to allow DA Fonnie Willis to continue prosecuting this case. They didn't give a reason why they canceled it. What should we read into it? I mean, does it, this was always the case that seemed to have the most struggles anyway. Does it yeah. feel like it's winding down? There are four criminal cases against Donald Trump. For three of them, I could tell you with detail procedurally why or why not they may or may not go away. With Georgia, all I can tell you is that this case is likely going away. I just couldn't tell you exactly how. And the reason why I say that is that there are so many off-ramps for this case. Consider this. All this time, the case has not been stayed. I mean, it's supposedly moving along through the appellate courts or whatever. Have you heard anything about it? Any news on it? Right. Look, everything in Georgia moves glacially. In the last major RICO case, it took them, not involving Trump, involving a minor celebrity or maybe a major celebrity, depending on, on your view. Either way, it took them eight months to pick a jury, not to try the case. The case just ended. It's been years and years and years. For whatever reason, things do not move quickly in Georgia, in Fulton County. And also, this DA, the elected DA, has made some questionable decisions, decisions that have resulted in additional delay, and she may still get kicked off the case. And if that happens, the case is orphaned, and they have to search around for another prosecutor's office who's willing to take it. So, Joe... I cannot tell you exactly how this case is going to weigh, go away. There are just so many possibilities on the roulette wheel that if this case is going to go away. I just don't know exactly how it's going to happen. All right, Danny, thank you so much. Well, a powerful bomb cyclone is packing heavy rain and snow. It has more than 600,000 people in the Northwest without power. It's impacting parts of California, Oregon, and Washington, and it is just getting started. Some experts forecast the region could see a month's worth of rain in just three or four days. Meteorologists are warning of hurricane force winds along Oregon's coast. That is very rare for the state. They're also predicting mountainous seas that could crest as high as 34 feet. For people in low-lying areas, the biggest threat is going to be flash flooding and mudslides. Well, those living in higher elevations could see up to three feet of snow. On the other side of the country, some much-needed rain could be in store for the Northeast. More than half the states right now are under moderate drought conditions. Experts are calling this one of the driest falls on record. The culprit now for that potentially record-breaking West Coast weather, it's called an atmospheric river. NBC News national climate reporter Chase Kane explains what that is, what it does, and how it forms. It's a weather event, and when it's severe, it can be catastrophic. It's not a hurricane or a tornado, it's called an atmospheric river. But what exactly is that? Well, an atmospheric river is a narrow current of wind carrying huge plumes of moisture stretching for hundreds or even thousands of miles high in the sky, kind of like a big floating river. Technically, they're the largest rivers of freshwater on Earth, transporting on average more than double the flow of the Amazon River. And when an atmospheric river transports tropical moisture over dry land and that moisture collides with mountains, like California's Sierra Nevada range, for example, the water vapor rises and quickly cools, creating extreme rainfall and sometimes feed of snow. And while not all atmospheric rivers are dangerous, research from UCSD predicts climate change will make them more intense and more frequent, which could make flooding two or three times more likely. Well, that's a problem, especially on the West Coast, where Cal Fire says more than a million acres of land has burned this year in California alone. 
and wildfires make it harder for the top layer of soil to absorb water. So when torrential rain hits, the water runs off more quickly and that can trigger flash flooding. And that's something officials are warning of the threat of five to upwards of 10 inches of rain along California's Redwood Coast and Northern Mountain Ranges on Wednesday. On Thursday, the threat of floods and mudslides peaks. And with this one, the National Weather Service urges people to follow local alerts and not to travel through hazardous conditions. Chase Kane, NBC News. For more on the coast-to-coast -coast weather, let's bring in NBC meteorologist Angie Lassman. She's keeping an eye on everything coast-to-coast -coast for us this morning. Hey there, Angie. Hey there, guys. We've got a couple of storm systems. The one that you just heard uh, Chase talking about, and then one on the east coast that is actually going to bring us some beneficial rain, specifically for the northeast. But let's start out west, where already an active kind of pattern. You can see this system swirling off into the Pacific, and all of the rain and additional snow that folks across the Pacific Northwest and extending into Northern California are getting. One thing that you might have seen on social media is this thing called a bomb cyclone. What is that? This has been a kind of a word that we've started to see become more popularized in recent years. It basically is a low pressure system that intensifies very quickly. The, the category is about 24 millibars in 24 hours. This system has had incredible strengthening over a very short period of time. Basically, Monday night to last night, it dropped 66 millibars. All that tells you is that it is intensifying, it is strengthening, and it has more to go. And all that means is that we're going to see strong winds delay delivered to the coast. We've already seen that in some spots. And on top of that, this is coupled with that atmospheric river event. So this is like two parts of all the same system. We've got the area of low pressure and we've got this uh, delivery of all this moisture that Chase was just talking about. So that atmospheric river is going to be ongoing over the next couple of days and it's going to drive basically most of that moisture, especially into Northern California. And we rate these. Uh, the Center for Western Weather and Water Extremes kind of gives you a category of how extreme those um, atmospheric river events are going to be. And notice we're in the exceptional category in, in some of these locations. So this is why we're so concerned about the flooding over the next couple of days. Here's what it looks like when you, you put in the, the rain and the snow across this region. We've got heavy rain, especially again, Northern California, Bay Area, up into the Southern portions of Oregon. And, and of course that mountain snow at times will be quite intense. That means travel is gonna be difficult. And this is something that we see ongoing into tomorrow too. So the risk for flash flooding, the mudslides, all gonna be there across this region. This lasts into Friday. This will be something that we watch more so towards the Intermountain region by Friday, but still any additional rain across this region is going to be problematic. And I mentioned the bomb cyclone bringing us the potential for really strong winds. The wind alerts are up across this region and notice we're talking 40, 50 mile per hour wind gusts peak through most of these locations, but we could see gusts up to 70 miles per hour, the down trees, the down power lines, all of that is gonna be a possibility. Uh, but most concerning, I think, over the next couple of days is gonna be the flooding. We'll see that flash flood risk. You can see where we have that brighter pink, that's a moderate risk. So Santa Rosa up to Garberville, those are the spots that we could see the, the, the biggest concern there, especially considering we could have over a foot of rain through the end of wow. the week. So, of course, beneficial rain, we always say this, but not all at once. This will be something that likely causes problems when it comes to travel. We'll also see that additional snowfall in that region. Um, and that's just one of the really active patterns we have right. going on on that side of the country today. Just in time for everybody to get on the road or in the air for Thanksgiving. Exactly. I remember, Hopefully it'll be wrapped up. I remember living in Seattle when these atmospheric rivers, and it was just days of just being... Yeah. Very wet all the time. Yeah, and besides and so. being inconvenient, it's also, you know, the mudslides, the flooding, all of that exactly. can be quite dangerous. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Angie. Of course. Some people who were hit hard by Hurricane Helene in western North Carolina, they say they feel forgotten by the federal government almost two months after the storm tore through the state. And many of them are still living in temporary housing and say so far they've gotten less than $1,000 in aid from FEMA. NBC News correspondent Stephanie Gosk has more from Capitol Hill, where yesterday lawmakers grilled the head of FEMA about the agency's response. Hurricane Helene tore through six states, the most destructive storm in North Carolina's history. Less than two weeks later, Hurricane Milton ripped apart Florida's already battered West Coast. On Capitol Hill, FEMA's administrator, Deanne Criswell, criticized over the agency's response. Do you think you could have done better? We can always improve, and we will review all is that a our yes? response efforts. Is, is that a yes? Nobody is perfect. Melinda Williams spoke to us in what's left of her North Carolina home. I am only alive by God's grace. She was in the house when the water tore it off the foundation, somehow managing to survive. Do you recognize pieces I do. of that your is, house that's, wrapped around this tree? That's my kitchen. 
But while the local government has helped, she says she has seen little federal assistance. Her application um, still pending. It's kind of like they've forgotten about the people. Your neighbors. Yeah. You. You feel forgotten. I do feel forgotten by the government. I do. Williams told us she was given a $750 check for immediate needs, but still no assistance to rebuild her lost home. I haven't really seen anybody that I know that's really received any real help. And it's been weeks. It's been weeks. Administrator Criswell right defending the agency's response. I am incredibly proud of the work that the 22,000 members of this workforce have done. To but FEMA, she says, needs more money. The cost to respond to these two disasters is outpacing all other disasters in the previous 10 years except for Hurricane Maria. The administrator also grilled over a FEMA employee in Florida who told workers to skip homes with Trump signs after Hurricane Milton. Criswell says that employee wasn't following FEMA policy and was fired. We are currently investigating this But that's not what you said. You said this IG. is isolated, reprehensible, hasn't happened. This is the only time. And they're saying, nope, 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 it's commonplace. The destruction between the historic back-to-back -back storms is estimated to be $170 billion. And for some, there's an urgent need. It's hard. It was my home that it just isn't here anymore. This is temporary housing being set up by FEMA. They say individuals can qualify for up to $85,000 in FEMA assistance. But some of the people we speak to on the ground here in North Carolina say that the application process is complicated and the help is taking too long. Back to you. All right, Stephanie, thank you so much. We've got much more to come here on Morning News Now later this hour. One small step in America's mission back to the moon and beyond. We're on yesterday's test launch by SpaceX and what it could mean for the future of commercial space exploration. Up first after the break, a legal victory for hip-hop mogul Sean Diddy Combs. The new ruling by a federal judge over possible evidence in his sex crimes trial. We'll be right back. Welcome back. The federal judge in the Sean Diddy Combs case here in New York has ordered prosecutors not to use 19 pages of notes they seized from his jail cell last week. In a hearing on Tuesday, attorneys for Combs argued that seizure violated attorney-client privilege. Prosecutors say the notes aren't privileged and that they are an attempt to tamper with witnesses from jail. For now, the judge is telling prosecutors not to include these documents as part of its case. Well, he holds on to them. Combs awaits trial on sex-related crimes. Prosecutors are accusing him of abusing and exploiting women. Combs continues to deny those charges and has pleaded not guilty. In Los Angeles, a desperate search is underway to find a woman who suddenly vanished after missing her connecting flight at LAX. Her family is now telling NBC News they believe she is in danger after receiving alarming text messages from her before she went completely silent. NBC News correspondent Ellison Barber has the story. But what we have believed, what we have believed to be telling people is true. This is Hannah Kobayashi's family. Her aunts and her dad in Los Angeles, a city where none of them live, desperately searching for the 30-year-old who's been missing for more than a week. We honestly don't know what to do. Her family telling NBC News they believe Hannah is in physical danger. There's reason to believe through video surveillance that Hannah is not okay. And everything that we, everything that we have been telling the media, that we've been telling the police has now been confirmed. We cannot speak on it because we do not want to hinder the investigation. But what we have believed, what we have believed to be telling people is true. And we cannot speak more on that. But we, it has been confirmed to us that Hannah is in danger. On November 8th, she took a flight from her hometown in Hawaii, heading to visit her aunt in New York. She left Maui and landed at LAX, but according to her family, missed her connection flight to New York. She only had about 30 to 45 minutes to get from one terminal to the other, and she didn't make it. Surveillance video capturing her as she exited a jetway at LAX. Her family says they were communicating with her. They believe she had a standby ticket and was trying to get on another flight to New York, but decided to spend time exploring LA while she waited. Here's LeBron James event. A video posted to YouTube seemingly catching her for a split second at a Nike event at the city's Grove Mall. But as the days went by, 
Friends and family say they started to get odd texts. It started to get extremely strange and scary. Um, we started getting text message, basically the verbiage was unlike her, using words like hun, babe, things that she normally in her own text weren't saying. She said that someone um, might was stealing her identity, that she felt scared, um, that she, weird things like um, the matrix. One exchange obtained by our Honolulu affiliate KHNL said, quote, I got tricked pretty much into giving away all my funds for someone I thought I loved. It's been really scary. By Monday, November 11th, her family says all communication stopped. Their panicked calls went straight to voicemail. I'm just, just twisting and turning and spinning. It's just crazy and it is, it is every parent's worst nightmare. A spokesperson for the Los Angeles Police Department confirming to NBC News a missing persons report for Hannah Kobayashi was filed on the 15th and detectives are actively investigating. Her family also organizing searches of their own, eagerly waiting for any news of their beloved Hannah. We might be small, but we are mighty and we are going to find you. And don't you dare think that we for a second will give up on this. We are, you are in our hearts. The entire world is looking for you. You are that special. Anna's family tells us they believe she is still wearing glasses and that she probably has a dark green moss colored backpack with her. If you think you see her or if you think you know anything, the family and authorities are saying contact police in Los Angeles immediately. In terms of canvassing and search efforts, her family has started a Facebook group called Help Us Find Hannah. They say information related to their search efforts is posted on that Facebook page. Back to you. All right, Allison Barber, thank you. Coming up to the moon and beyond, SpaceX successfully launching its most powerful rocket yet. We're on yesterday's test flight and how it could bring us closer to commercial space exploration. Plus, you might want to sit down for this one, just not for too long. The new study that shows a link between sitting and heart disease. Dr. Azar is in with our weekly checkup next on Morning News Now. And with that, the race to put humans back on the moon and beyond took another step forward. SpaceX launched its most powerful rocket on another test flight. The round trip journey is designed to evaluate the safety and performance of the booster and the spacecraft. NBC News correspondent Jesse Kirsch joins us with more on this. Hey there, Jesse. Good morning. Hey, Joe, good morning. This was Starship's sixth test flight. And you might remember that incredible catch last month where the super heavy booster returned to the launch tower. That did not happen this time. But SpaceX says it did collect data that will help the company as it attempts to stretch the limits of human space exploration. This morning, another roaring SpaceX liftoff is in the books. The company launching Starship from South Texas Tuesday afternoon, propelled by its most powerful rocket. Wow, the ship is doing great so far. The empty spacecraft pushed to the limit to see how it would do with challenges, like successfully restarting its engines in space and repositioning itself before splashdown in the Indian Ocean. What a great reorientation by Starship. But unlike last month's eye-popping booster landing and catch... We are no-go for tower catch. SpaceX determined this time around the Super Heavy booster would not be able to return to the launch pad safely. The company diverting the booster to a water landing. Despite that, former NASA astronaut Leroy Chow says the test flight is still a success. Well, it's not a fail, it's just that they don't have it completely nailed down. Watching Tuesday's launch from the ground, President-elect Donald Trump, next to SpaceX CEO Elon Musk, who has been tapped to co-lead a new department of government efficiency. Mr. Trump recently becoming a supporter of Musk's space ventures. We want to reach Mars before the end of my term. That mission to Mars, a years-long focus for Musk. But is that just science fiction or a glimpse into the future? Starship and the a super heavy booster have only been under development for about 10 years, and it's pretty amazing how far they've come. 
And of course, we'll be looking for more catches with the launch tower's chopstick arms because the goal of Starship is for this to be a reusable system. Joe. All right, Jesse, thank you so much. So cool. All right, now it's time for our weekly medical checkup. We're going to start with a national poll that says parents are saying they need a little help when it comes to dealing with their kids' big feelings. Plus, this morning we're taking a stand. Literally, we've got the latest on how sitting down can actually affect your heart health. The doctor is in. We've got NBC News medical contributor Dr. Kavita Patel joining us with that and other health headlines you might have missed. Dr. Patel, always great to have you with us. Let's start on that poll that we just mentioned. So this is parents responding to this poll, uh, saying that they need some support when it comes to helping their kids navigate big emotions, like when they're angry. What are some of the challenges that parents face here, and what are some tips you've got to make that easier? Yeah, 2,000 parents that responded in this national survey, seven out of 10 said that they worry about setting a bad example. One in three said that they really never had any advice on how to deal with these like incredibly stressful emotions from their children, as well as some of the temper tantrums. Four in 10 parents say that their child's anger has actually caused them to feel like they're giving like bad parenting, bad results in their parenting. So Savannah Joe, this is definitely like underscoring something the Surgeon General has recently talked about that not only is parenting hard, but this is something that's really complicated. So I think the doctor's orders here it's really about modeling self-care. It's actually part of parenting. So just when you start thinking and reacting to emotions, you really need to just stop. We talk about calm techniques, breathing with children. We need to do it ourselves. And then something that we're really learning from early education is to be a lighthouse as a parent. I'm trying to do this with my own kids, not to try to solve their problems. When you see a child losing their temper or doing something, your immediate thought is to rush in and do something to kind of help fix it. Try to avoid that. Try to help show them how to problem solve. And then be comfortable that they need to be uncomfortable in their emotions, that that's actually part of learning how to struggle. And that's part of parenting. That lighthouse advice is fantastic. Yeah, I don't think we, yeah. we see enough of that often in kids these days. So speaking of kids, yeah. I mean, the bond between students and teachers who are also lighthouses, they can be very special. Researchers <laughs> are saying connections like this can actually have an impact on kids and their development. What did this study find? Yeah, so look, we've known that early education has incredible power. They studied 14,000 United States students from kindergarten through third grade at around 2010. So this is about 14 years ago. And what they were looking for was to see if you had kind of this bond of trust, both reported by teachers and students, then what happened over time? What, and, and what they saw is that overall, just over time, relationships all around, not just with teachers, but with other students and with other adults were positive. And that relationships in early learning had long-term effects on learning later in life, coping, adjustment skills, and that the power of the student-teacher bond, when it was strong back then, it retained a lot of these characteristics over time. So this is really one of those doctor's orders that really does make a lot of sense, that early trust leads to lifelong strength. I think here's the key with how to find this, though. Not every state, not every city has these early education opportunities. So if you are listening right now and you're a parent or you're expecting a family, think about where to find these early education opportunities. They might not be in the places that you think of. Look for nonprofits. Look for places where you can see this. And then obviously in kindergarten, make sure that you have that bond with your child and with your teacher. That can be incredibly important. Mm. Such, such, such good advice there. Um, okay, let's talk about the sitting one. So if you're sitting down, maybe don't yeah. get too comfortable. Um, <laughs> researchers say sitting too much can be linked to a higher risk of heart disease. And here's what I think is interesting, right. even if you exercise regularly. So I right. guess explain that, like how much is too much? And for people who do like, you know, have to sit all day at work, what can we do to help this? Yeah, so this is what we call kind of a cohort survey. This was a set of 89,000 adults that were monitored from 2006 to 2011, Savannah, and they wore an accelerometer, kind of that thing that you usually see in planes or automobiles to tell you which way you're moving, if you're getting up or down. And, and basically over time, looking to see if there was a relationship, not a cause, because you can't really look at that in this type of study, but if there was a relationship from people in those five years that were largely sedentary, that didn't move much, and whether they had outcomes like heart failure, heart attacks, atrial fibrillation, kind of problems with the heart, that can result in mortality. People can die from these events. So over time, they saw anywhere from a 40 to 54% increase in risk if you had an incredibly sedentary lifestyle. How much is too sedentary? Sitting for about 10 to 10.6 hours on average was kind of correlated with this higher risk. And to your point, Savannah, that was in people who also had outside of those 10 hours 
exercise. What it tells us is that the body is not meant to sit for that long. I think we've all known it right. during the pandemic. We were all trying to make sure we got away from our screens. But this just tells us that it's something about just that sedentary moment, even if you get up after 10 hours and do a hard workout, even though that's good, it's right. not enough. So the doctor's order is here. Set a timer to move. Make sure that you move every half hour to hour. Standing is not good enough. So I just want to say those of us like me who stand, you need to also be moving. Encourage walking and talking. Even if you've got a kind of job like the two of you do, when you have those brief moments, try to just pace or do something behind your chairs. And then don't forget about exercise. So it doesn't mean that you should not exercise if you have a sedentary lifestyle. You should include that as well. All right, Dr. Kavita Patel, great information as always. Thank you. Coming up, a real-life Onion headline, the satirical paper now being sued by Alex Jones over the purchase of his right-wing conspiracy site, more on the fight to stop the sale. Plus, you might know him as the Schlemiel and Schlemazel of Parks and Rec. Now, actor Jim O'Hare is taking on a new role, author. He's going to join us next to talk about his new book that looks back at some of his favorite memories from the show. You're watching Morning News now. Welcome back. One of the country's largest home warranty companies called American Home Shield is facing thousands of complaints from its customers. Well, some of the business's promotions promise to cover everything under your roof. NBC News Now anchor Vicki Wynn found out that might not always be the case. Home warranty. American Home Shield is one of the country's biggest home warranty companies with more than 2 million subscribers. And its ads make a simple promise. Covered repairs and replacements are taken care of. Pay a fee and they'll cover your appliances. No repair records needed, even undetectable pre-existing conditions. But in Las Vegas, Julian Sanchez and Patricia Nunez say they lost their cool with the company during the city's hottest summer on record. Most of the time in this room, it would reach onwards of the high 90s to low 100s. They say AHS declined to repair or replace their air conditioner after it broke down in May, despite the couple's monthly coverage payments for the past three years. The company sent this repairman, seen here on home security video, to inspect the unit, but Julian says he left it in even worse shape. They removed a piece of my AC unit and they left it on my roof. What did you expect? I expect it would be just a quick diagnostic and then a fix, and what I got was the complete opposite. AHS denied the Sanchez repair claim, saying the unit had stopped working because of foreign debris and not the normal wear and tear covered in the contract. The unrelenting heat forcing the couple and their five children to do homework and sleep on the ground floor. It's just been atrocious, the way that the company has dealt with everything. The family's frustration echoed in thousands of complaints filed against AHS with the Better Business Bureau. They will find a way to deny the claim. Consumer attorney Alex Bachua says AHS often uses the term not normal wear and tear to deny claims in his clients' cases. Do you think that phrase is intentionally vague? Yes, of course. Every single case I have is the same. They come out there, they diagnose the problem, they say not normal wear and tear. From that perspective... It's good for business, it's bad for consumers. After NBC News reached out for comment, American Home Shield declined an interview but said in part in a statement it believes the correct coverage decision was made, adding, as a gesture of goodwill and an accommodation to Mr. Sanchez, we will fix his unit at no cost. Melanie McGovern with the BBB says consumers should read both the contract and reviews before choosing a home warranty company. Read the complaint data, read the reviews, and then make their purchasing decision from there. Did the company respond? Did they get it all settled? The Sanchez family, now working with attorney Alex Bachua, says they declined the AHS repair offer and they want a replacement. Vicki Wynn, NBC News, Las Vegas. Our thanks to Vicky for that report. Well, let's get to some other money news. Alex Jones is now fighting back against the sale of Infowars to the Onion. CNBC Savannah Hanau has that and some other financial headlines. Savannah, good morning. Hey, Joe. Hey, Savannah. Good morning to you. Yes, yeah, so the proposed sale of Infowars to the Onion is taking a new turn with Alex Jones fighting back against a transaction involving his right-wing conspiracy website. In a lawsuit filed yesterday, Jones's attorneys allege The Onion's parent company and several Sandy Hook families submitted an illegitimate bid in a bankruptcy auction and 
plan to misuse his intellectual property. Last week, The Onion said it won the auction with support from the families and plans to relaunch InfoWars as another satire site with advocacy group Every Town for Gun Safety as an advertiser. The bankruptcy court judge has ordered a hearing for next week. Bitcoin is hovering near record highs around $94,000 as it continues to rally since President-elect Trump's victory. Bitcoin's gains have been driven by expectations the incoming administration will look favorably towards cryptocurrencies. The markets will be closely tracking any news on Trump's upcoming pick for Treasury Secretary with an announcement potentially coming as soon as today. And Delta Airlines will start serving Shake Shack burgers in first class. The service will begin on flights out of Boston on December 1st and expand to other markets throughout 2025. Customers in first class on routes over 900 miles will be able to pre-select a Shake Shack cheeseburger as their food option. The meal also features chips, a Caesar salad, and a dark chocolate brownie, guys. All right. Savannah, okay, thank you so much. That is huge news. <laughs> yeah. Shake Shack on a plane. Whoa. Thank you for the most important story of the morning, Savannah. <laughs> All right. One of America's most beloved workplace misfits, Gary, Larry, Terry, Jerry, Jerry is giving fans a behind the scenes look at some of the best moments from the iconic sitcom Parks and Rec. That's right, it's actor Jim O'Hare and he has a new book out today. It's called Welcome to Pawnee, where he is sharing never before told stories that capture the comedy and warmth from the show's seven season run. And the man himself, Jim O'Hare, joins us this morning. Yay. Jim, good to have you with us. Good Congratulations morning. on all of this. I wrote a book. I, I didn't know about it. A book. What I world know. are we living Forever. in? Today? I you have my name on a book. Author. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it has exactly. been nine years. What since the it's show said goodbye? That, that's Almost why the timing was kind of perfect. Yeah, so uh, talk about that. Why did you why did you want to do this and how this timing is just is right? Isn't the it? timing was perfect um, because of the ten year anniversary. But the reason I wanted to do it was uh, I call this and for a better term I don't have but it's my kind of my love letter to the show mm -hmm. uh, this was uh, th the show was a gift it, it, and for the miracle of television we're still out there we're on television stations we're on streaming and so it's still important to people and um, I just wanted everyone to know what a special thing it was and so this book is full of stories that I guarantee the fans have never heard before uh, I, I interviewed the writer the creators of the show are in the book and the actors and you know, Chris Pratt gave me so much time he's such a busy you might have heard of Chris Pratt Who? He's, a busy, yeah, he's a busy busy man he gave me so much time and um, so my, but my goal was I wanted people to hear things they've never heard before because yeah. you know it's been out for a long time That's and cool. this bowl and I know I accomplished it because I learned things I'd never heard before wow. so that that was my, that was awesome. Okay, can you give us like any peek of anything like well, that? Well, a couple of before? things. Uh, number one, a couple of things. Amy Poehler, not the first one hired. I just always assumed it was, oh, wow. I mean, when I was hired, it was called the Untitled Amy Poehler Project. <laughs> I assumed she was on board. Uh, she was, Aziz was hired first. Uh, uh, Nick Offerman, who played Ron Swanson, I can't imagine anybody playing Ron Swanson. Right. Had been, initially, they were interested uh, for him for The Office. But he had another gig on his wife's show called Will and Grace, yes. uh. and he couldn't do it. Had he done The Office, the odds are he never would have done Parks and Recreation huh. because wow, right. they wouldn't have wanted the... They already Especially had Rashida Jones and Chris Cross. Yeah. Yeah. So there was it's stories like that. And then Pratt tells you how Guardians happened because the cast, the producers were like, we'll make this work. We're going to let you go and do it. They even moved us to London for a couple of episodes so that Chris could be in London wow. while he was shooting Guardians and still do some of Parks. So these are things that I never knew, and that I loved so it. That is so cool. I love finding out. Love the ins and outs. All right, so your character, Jerry. Yes. Let's see, I, like he like told people he got mugged. He really was injured picking up a burrito. In a, he, in a, in a, little, pot, in a little creek. He, yeah. lo he looped <laughs> his belt around the office. <laughs> Inept, is that a good, like, are, are you anything like Jerry, what was it like playing <laughs> this character? I mean, so. I, like him. I think Jerry's a lovely man, and like we should all be like Jerry. <laughs> yeah. as so far you're as the that. stretch to play him. Yeah, I don't. I'm not so bumbling. Um, but Jerry, yes, he is. You know, Ron Swanson called him the schlemiel and the schlamazel yeah. of the office. Uh, he was both. Uh, but Jerry is very lovable. He's a very sweet man. The cast will tell you because they've all said it. 
I am the least like my character. If you're going to uh. find who's the most or least like their characters, Nick Offerman, we would say probably the most like his character, <laughs> uh, but I'm the least. And Jerry was definitely the punching bag of the office. You know, there's no doubt. But they also gave him an incredible life. His wife was played by Christy Brinkley. He had these three yeah. gorgeous daughters. <laughs> he had it all. Yeah. He really did so, have it all. Did they ever bring you an idea and you were like, no, that one's too, that's a bridge too far. That could never happen. Because, yeah. too, I trusted these people with my life, these writers. But also, uh, Amy Poehler, who is, you know, you can't get me started on Amy because I can just ramble how much I love her all day oh. long. But she was very much the mother on the set, even though I'm older than her. And she would check in with us. Hey, is, are you comfortable with this? Are you comfortable with that? Like that episode in particular, at one point my character bends over, my pants split, and there's a big farting episode, the fart attack episode. And she's like, are you comfortable with that? I said, I was born for this. <laughs> are you kidding? I live this every day. Uh, so no, I, I tried, those I writers were so smart. You know, the cast got a lot of credit for improvisation. And we were all, most of us have an improv background. But the writing was so smart. Week after week, I'd leave a table read and go, they did it again. How are they still doing this? But the quality never wavered. And that's when you hit the sweet spot, when you have great writing and yes. a great improv, and it all comes together. I think so. Jim O'Hare, the book is called Welcome to Pawnee. Look at that Congratulations. Awesome cover. Love it. I love that cover. Yeah, it's so cool. I love the cover. You are. Oh, it literally says, That's yeah, me. Yes, yeah, you can find me. Yeah, yeah there I that's am. That's me. There yeah. you go. Well, people confuse me and Rob Lowe, so I had <laughs> to <laughs> be very specific about who I was. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank <laughs> Thanks, you, you guys. Congrats the book. Coming up, something bad is happening in Oz. That's right. It's not all wonderful in the Emerald City because fans are fighting over the new Wicked movie and whether it is acceptable to sing in the theater. Yeah, up next, we're going to break down the gravity-defying debate that has some Wicked lovers singing, singing this, I'm limited. Stay with us. This is Morning <laughs> News Now. Welcome back. You might remember the Barbenheimer craze, which proved opposites have a way of attracting billions at the box office. Well, now there is a new double feature causing some excitement. Wicked and Gladiator 2, or Glicked, is hoping to recapture the same kind of money movie magic. Both of the highly anticipated features are hitting theaters this Friday, but there's no unadulterated loathing here. Mm -hmm. Fans are already showing off their tickets to both films on social media. Elphaba and Glinda, or Cynthia Erivo and Ariana Grande from Wicked and Gladiator star Paul Mezcal have also raised their swords and brooms in approval. But does Glicked have everything that really counts to be popular? Will audiences be entertained? We're gonna have to wait and see. I, I say think yes. we know the answer. It's so good. It's so good. Well, let's stay on Wicked. We're just two short days away from it making its leap from the stage to the big screen. But the movie's debut is fans debating over proper movie theater etiquette. Should the audience be allowed to sing along with the cast during the movie? Well, in an interview with NBC, Ariana and Cynthia gave their take on the debate. Take a listen. It's Whatever tempting. I know, yeah, why not? We understand it. I understand, yeah. We understand it. If you do, and if you don't, yeah. you respect the feelings. I say, if you come the first time and you sing through, sing through. But come a second time and let us sing to you. Yeah, and if someone throws popcorn at you or their phone or something, maybe stop. <laughs> Joining us now for more on this debate is entertainment journalist, pop culture expert and friend of the show, Brian Balthazar. Brian, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us on this. Hey there. So uh, we just heard what Ariana and Cynthia had to say. They are wrong. But what are people <laughs> saying online? <laughs> Well, it's a very mixed debate, right? Some people really believe they sound like Cynthia Erivo. Newsflash, you don't. But um, the thing is, this is not like a concert, right? So concerts, often the artist will say a line of their show and then hand it back to the audience, and the audience will then sing back. That doesn't traditionally happen in movies, right? Okay, so there's there's this debate about whether it's not to, whether it's good to feel passionate enough about the song to sing it out loud. And I will say, I think they actually tiptoed around the answer rather carefully because obviously, movie makers, the, the stars of the show, the people behind it, don't want people to feel disillusioned. This is a movie about inclusion and and empowerment and doing what what's true to you. But I'm here to say. Don't do it. It's not a concert. I mean, am I supposed to be objective here? Because I'm no. sorry. This is like asking someone <laughs> if they like Hawaiian pizza. It's not like when you say you like Hawaiian pizza, that's okay. You're not hurting anyone. If you pay to see a movie <laughs> and you hear your cousin singing, that's not the same thing. You pay to see the concert. And that's why they're doing sing-along concerts this coming Christmas. They're actually, this is what happens with the sound of music. People want to sing along. So they're like, let's do a whole event where you're supposed to sing along. Yeah. That's not what this is yet. 
Okay, yeah. sorry, you go ahead. Wait, yeah. they're, they're you doing... don't sing in a Broadway show, so you don't sing right. here. I mean, oh, yeah. yeah. I exactly. just think it's so funny how passionate y'all are. Because, okay, so Brian, I don't really like musicals. I think you know that. But I've seen Wicked. I loved it. The songs are totally stuck in my head. I would never sing aloud because my voice is so bad. I would just be, like, so embarrassed to do that in public. Right. But right. <laughs> wait, really quickly on what you just said, are you saying that Wicked there's going to be sing-alongs to that are planned for later? Yes, later in December, they're going to have special event screenings where people can sing along and, and do their thing. Come in character, do all of those things. And here's a clip. I'd like us to make this clip audio. Send it to your friends. I know you think you sound amazing. I know you think like you sound like Ariana and Cynthia. <laughs> you don't? Zipit.com, zipit.org. <laughs> Just listen and enjoy the show. The audio is there for a reason. Enjoy the show. Then go to a screening where you can sing along. Do both. <laughs> I agree. It's the opposite of what they said. They said, sing right, at the theater, then go back and enjoy. Yeah. No. They were being polite. They were being polite. Enjoy. Like, I'm surprised it's not having any impact on you, but the, the stars themselves said they're cool with it. Well, because they, I well, don't think they want to isolate Ariana, people. No, mm, yeah, no so. we disagree. We disagree to disagree. I know I'm dressed like the train conductor in Oz. <laughs> I feel passionately about it. <laughs> You look great, Brian. Joe. Okay, Joe I think this, this is kind of the point you're making because of it, this, like, not being a concert. But is this different than when everybody was talking about the same kind of thing at Taylor's Era Tours when it was in, stu in yeah. movie theaters and same yeah. with Beyonce yeah, Renaissance? Different. Yeah, it's different <laughs> because you stand up and sing at a concert. I think the reference of saying, like, they expect you to sing along. They offer it up to the audience to sing along. They're not doing that in the movie. They're not, not stopping everything. We're like, hey, you fill it in row 18. Take it. They don't do that in the movie. <laughs> Sorry. I am 100% on board with this. Oh, what I want to do is I want to be in the theater with Brian because I will have the yeah. same response when someone does start singing because I will tell right. them. You will? Right. Joe and I will be throwing popcorn and <laughs> Wait, Brian, wait, 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 let's, say, let's say I'm singing. I will be like, I'm not here to hear you. Please be quiet. I would like to enjoy You will say that to sing. someone. 100%. Yeah, they're bothering oh, yeah. Brian, would you do that? I would do the mom pinch, you know, when they're like trying to be very discreet and they grab your leg and start pinching increasingly. But what if you didn't away? know them, Brian? Yeah, no, I'm saying I would that do makes that. It to easier. You. <laughs> <pinch there>. <laughs> <laughs> the gentle this pinch. Is... If you keep the pinch, I'm not, the I'm not entirely <laughs> convinced that y'all are in the right, but I'm I'm happy that you are passionate. We'll enjoy the show. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Brian. Thank you. Let's gonna do it for Thank this you. hour of morning news now. But the news continues right now. Stay with us. Good morning. Thanks for joining us this Wednesday. I'm Savannah Sellers. I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, we are tracking a dangerous one-two punch from Mother Nature slamming the West Coast. It's a powerful bomb cyclone, and it's bringing hurricane-force winds and widespread power outages to folks in the Northwest, plus an atmospheric river that's drenching parts of California. Our Angie Lastman is tracking it all in just a moment. Also this morning, more political shockwaves echoing throughout Washington. President-elect Donald Trump tagging in wrestling magnet Linda McMahon for education secretary and TV personality Mehmet Oz to run Medicare and Medicaid. That's ahead of a critical meeting on Capitol Hill today over whether to release that controversial misconduct report on AG pick Matt Gates. We're going to bring you the very latest. We're also talking turkey. New numbers might give us a better picture of just how much of a bite all that Thanksgiving shopping could take out of your budget this year. And later in the hour, Savannah and I are reaching for the sky. The sky lift, that is. 30 Rock's thrilling new attraction that's taking us nearly 1,000 feet above NYC. We'll reveal which one of us got the most scared. Don't think scared. it's going to be any big reveal if you just had your eyes open. By far. <laughs> I don't like heights. <laughs> Barely. <laughs> I clung to that thing in the middle the whole time, or Joe, for momentary. <laughs> you will get to relive all Journeys of this. to the edge. <laughs> Coming up a little later in the hour. Let's begin, though, out west, where more than 600,000 people are without power this morning as a powerful storm system pummels the Pacific Northwest. Parts of California, Oregon, and Washington state all bracing for nearly a foot and a half of rain through Friday. Experts also warn of hurricane-force winds to parts of the coast that could trigger flash floods and mudslides. People who live in higher elevations could see up to three feet of snow. NBC News correspondent Steve Patterson is live in California for us, and they are starting to feel these impacts from the storm system overnight. Steve, good morning. 
We are, Savannah. Guys, good morning. And this storm system, unfortunately, already proving deadly. It is being generated by two separate weather events. You have that bomb cyclone meeting with this atmospheric river, creating chaos out west, wreaking havoc across the region. Overnight, hurricane force winds packing powerful gusts up to 80 miles an hour wreaking havoc across the northwest. The so-called bomb cyclone taking aim late Tuesday. Oh, my God. Knocking up power to more than half a million people in Northern California, Washington, and Oregon. This is my street. It's literally fully dark. Fire and rescue teams in Washington responding to down power lines and trees. One woman killed when a large tree fell on a homeless encampment and two people were taken to the hospital after a tree fell on their trailer. While in California, an atmospheric river, a large plume of moisture, drenched the coast while turning to snow in the mountains. It's going to bring some significant precipitation to portions of Northern California. We're talking rainfall totals 10 to 20 inches possible with feet of snow, several feet of snow in the highest terrain. This is likely to result in significant flash flooding and landslides. The storm system, one of the strongest to hit the West Coast in decades, is expected to last through Friday. We got flashlights, batteries, water, canned goods. You know, I'm all stocked up. Because who knows, right? These are small roads. Anything could happen. And it is not the punch that we've received already. It is the sustained pressure of the rainfall totals, the snow totals increasing and sustaining until Friday, elevating the risk for mudslides and, of course, flash flooding. Guys. Steve, thank you. Let's get a closer look at your morning news now weather. We have Angie Lastman back in studio with us. Angie, good morning. Hi, good morning, guys. Steve is exactly right. We do have multiple things coming together to make this kind of a really dangerous situation on the West Coast. We also have some action happening on the East Coast. But let's start out West. You can see where that low-pressure area is swirling into the Pacific. The heavy rain, the heavy snow already started, as Steve mentioned. Here's what's going to kind of play out over the next uh, couple of days. We've already seen rapid strengthening. That is why this system is called a bomb cyclone. That basically just means the bomb bottom drops out when it comes to the pressure, i.e. it is getting stronger. So that's what we've seen already over the past 24 hours. We're going to continue to see that beeline of moisture direct to the coast uh, over the next couple of days. For California, you can see the atmospheric river setting up. Those two things are giving us a couple, a couple of scenarios. We've got the really strong winds that are happening from a, a strong system, that low pressure system, but we've also got just ample amo amounts of moisture to tap into in the coming days. This means that, that atmospheric river event on the scale of one to five, it is about a five. So this is a, a concerning situation, especially for parts of California, Northern California stretching into Southern Oregon. And these are some of the spots that we're gonna be most concerned over flooding in the coming days. So today, you can see where the moderate risk is. Garberville, Fort Bragg, Santa Rosa, but even just north of San Francisco and up through Crescent City, we're looking at the potential to see some of that flash flooding with impressive rainfall amounts happening over the next couple of days. Some of these spots are gonna receive, you know, seven to 10 inches. And those are widespread areas that could see that amount of rain, but we'll see upwards of a foot of rain in some locations. That means that this is life-threatening kind of flooding. We saw the same kind of scenario developing uh, with Helene, of course, in the Carolinas, where we get so much rain all at once where it doesn't have anywhere to go. And so this is why we're so concerned about this situation. We'll also see over three feet of snow possible in some of those mountainous regions. I mentioned how strong the system is. That's what's giving us all of those strong winds as well. Peak wind gusts 30, 40, 50, but close to 70 miles per hour in some isolated locations, so heads up there. Meanwhile, on the east, or in the east, I should say, we've got a, another storm system that's going to gear up and give us a little bit of rain and some snow across this region. Now, the northeast is going to see that system pushing in here through the day today, and then we'll start to see some of that cooler air work in behind it. That means wet snow for parts of the Great Lakes today, and then tomorrow, that spreads a little farther into the Appalachians. We'll also see some of that much-needed rain, guys, across the northeast. This is going to give us a good dose of rain to help with how dry it's been, but of course, not going to alleviate the drought uh, completely. We would need upwards of, you know, eight inches in some spots to see that kind of reverse. Um, but one to two inches is definitely going to help when it comes to how dry it's been. We can get. Yes. Absolutely. Andrew, thank you. Of course. Turning now to the Trump transition, the president-elect is personally pushing to drum up support for some of his more controversial cabinet picks while adding new names to his next administration. Here's NBC News Chief White House correspondent Peter Alexander. 
Going to you guys on some of those highest profile cabinet picks, this really is where the rubber begins to meet the road for Senate Republicans. Vice President-elect J.D. Vance is expected to meet today with lawmakers on Capitol Hill alongside Matt Gates and Defense Secretary pick Pete Hegseth, both of whom are facing some Republican resistance. And it comes as President-elect Trump is making a series of new picks, including Dr. Oz, to run one of the government's biggest bureaucracies. Overnight, President-elect Trump tapping Linda McMahon to lead the Department of Education, which he has repeatedly vowed to shut down. And one other thing I'll be doing very early in the administration is closing up the Department of Education in Washington, D.C., and sending all education and education work and needs back to the states. McMahon, who served in Trump's first administration, is a former World Wrestling Entertainment executive. It comes as Trump is standing by his embattled choice for attorney general, now former Congressman Matt Gates, offering this one word answer when asked if he was reconsidering the pick. No. The House Ethics Committee will meet today to weigh whether to release its report on Gates that focuses on alleged sexual misconduct and illicit drug use that Gates vehemently denies. While House Speaker Mike Johnson opposes the report's release, some Senate Republicans want to see it. I would like to see our committees do their full job. There needs to be legitimate vetting. An unidentified hacker was able to gain access to a file containing civil lawsuit depositions of two women who have made allegations against Gates, according to a source familiar with the matter and an email obtained by NBC News, though it's unclear whether that file has been released. The source says the file includes damaging testimony, including that of a woman who alleges she had sex with Gates when she was 17, and the testimony of a second woman who said she witnessed the 2017 encounter. A representative for Gates did not respond to NBC News' request for comment. Trump also picked Dr. Mehmet Oz to head the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services that oversees the Affordable Care Act. The longtime talk show host, physician, and failed Senate candidate is the latest TV personality tapped by Trump. Oz, who's faced criticism for promoting questionable medical advice, would work alongside HHS pick Robert F. Kennedy Jr. This morning, I think the real question is how willing Senate Republicans will be to reject Trump's picks. And if the nominees face the risk of not being confirmed, Trump's team is eyeing a workaround. One of his top deputies, Stephen Miller, last night telling Fox News, yes, President-elect Trump will use recess appointments if necessary that would allow picks to serve for up to two years without being confirmed. Back to you. All right, Peter, thank you so much. Well, as we just heard, President-elect Trump's Deputy Chief of Staff Stephen Miller is doubling down on the idea of bypassing the normal Senate confirmation process in order to push these nominations through. Here is what he said on Fox News last night. If there are some cabinet appointments that become troublesome, Will the president use the recess appointment process? Yes. The president has won a mandate, and he will use all lawful constitutional means to fulfill that mandate on behalf of the people who voted for him in record numbers. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitale joins us with more. Ali, let's just start right there. Can you explain to us how easy or difficult it would be for them to bypass that normal confirmation process? we could see in real time. And there are some reports of conversations that the president-elect's team might be having with the Speaker of the House's team so that they could trigger basically the environment that you would need in order to do recess appointments. It's a pretty convoluted process, and it's not clear, certainly, that the Senate would go along with that, but what it would take if the Senate is not on board to actually go through with that process. So we could see that. That would be very rare. And certainly, when you hear people, people like Senator Lisa Murkowski tell our Capitol Hill team yesterday that she wants to see the Senate do its job in a regular fashion, which is to say, vote on these nominees, exercise its role as the advise and consent branch to the executive branch. All of that is very much in the ether here. So it's not just Republican senators weighing, do they want to buck Trump on this one issue of cabinet picks, but also do they want to see themselves potentially get steamrolled in the process? There's a lot that's wrapped up in this, but when you hear people like Stephen Miller or Corey Lewandowski the other day, 
both longtime allies of the president-elect, when they're out there saying he has a mandate, you guys have the majority in the Senate because of Trump, that's a clear and not so subtle reminder to these senators of the political currency mm. that goes through all of these nominations, however difficult or easy they may be. And Ali, we've been talking a lot about this kind of like personal effort by President-elect Trump, by his vice president, J.D. Vance, to actually try to generate support yeah. for these controversial nominees in the Senate. How is that going? Is it fruitful? Well, we'll start to see it ramp up in the coming days, including today, as Gates is set to meet, along with J.D. Vance, as a sort of Sherpa in the Senate around some of these offices that might have reluctance or even have expressed outright distaste about his nominee for attorney general. The same goes for Pete Hegseth. Both of these men are dealing with allegations of sexual misconduct, the willingness of senators to either overlook that or hear their explanations and denials for that is really the open question up here on Capitol Hill. The other thing that's percolating in the background, as the as the former president, now president-elect, as well as his vice president-elect and other allies are trying to call around to the Hill and at least make the soil a little more fertile for people like Hegseth and Gates, while that's happening, we're also waiting to see the Ethics Committee on the House side vote later this afternoon on what they're going to do with the investigation that they've been doing on and off since 2021 into Gates and sexual misconduct and illicit drug allegations that he denies, but that they have nevertheless been investigating. We'll see whether or not that report is going to get released sometime later this afternoon. You remember the contours to this too, Savannah, the idea that the speaker is saying, don't release it, the guy is no longer a member, but the Senate and other members, including House Republicans, are saying, no, we would very much like to see this report out there. And Ali, whether that report comes out or not, we now have this new information that this hacker gained access to some of the private testimony from women yeah. who made allegations against Gates in a related civil case. This is not anything that happened behind closed doors with the House Ethics Committee, but it's a related matter and essentially reveals some of right. what we assume is the same information. Even with that information out there already, are we seeing an impact? Well, look, I think people are certainly aware of it, and there is so much scrutiny on that report in and of itself right now. And so the fact that a hacker could have gained access to it, certainly that is a point of concern. The committee itself, again, is voting to see if they release it. I have to say, though, in my conversations with lawmakers across the building, specifically Republicans, there seems to be a view that even if the Ethics Committee doesn't vote this out, that somehow this report is going to get leaked. Now, I've asked these lawmakers Okay, how would that happen? None of them are on the ethics committee. But I think that maybe they're wishing that that ends up coming out. But ultimately, the committee is going to have the final say on it. And we're going to know at some point this afternoon. Ali Vitali, a lot to cover. We appreciate it. Thank you. Let's turn now to several developments in Russia's war with Ukraine that are being closely watched around the world. Well, for the first time, Ukrainian forces have launched U.S.-made long-range missiles on targets inside Russia. This comes as Vladimir Putin sends a new nuclear warning to the West. NBC's chief international correspondent, Kier Simmons, joins us with the details here. Hi, Kier. Good morning. Hey there, good morning to you. And the former president of Russia, Dmitry Medvedev, has written on X that NATO could be targeted with weapons of mass destruction. Now, look, he has made these kinds of threats before, but certainly we are in a moment of escalation again over Ukraine. This morning, a serious warning to U.S. embassy staff in Kyiv, just days after Russia launched its largest airstrikes on Ukraine in months. The U.S. embassy closing its doors and telling employees to shelter in place, saying it has specific information of a potential significant air attack in the city today. Overnight, Ukraine's grinding land battle with Russia will be bolstered by more U.S. arms. The Biden administration approving the supply of landmines, a controversial weapon. It's another major U.S. policy shift after the White House allowed Ukraine to use long-range missiles inside of Russia, a move President Biden long resisted. Ukraine quickly firing six U.S. missiles across the Russian border for the first time. Moscow saying it intercepted five of the missiles and firing back with a message unmistakably directed at Ukraine and the U.S., saying it may now use nuclear weapons if attacked by a non-nuclear country allied with a nuclear state. Russia's foreign minister at the G20 summit in Brazil. We are strongly 
in favor of doing everything not to allow nuclear war to happen. NBC's Courtney Kuby speaking overnight with Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin at, point, at a summit in Laos. No, I, I don't see an indication that there's a, an imminent uh, intent to, to use nuclear weapons. President Zelensky asked last night by Fox News what would happen if the new Trump administration cuts funding to Ukraine. If they will cut, we will, I think we will lose. Of course, anyway, we will, we will stay, we will fight. Now, gaining those uh, landmines uh, may be a sign that Ukraine is trying to hold its battle lines uh, ahead of the arrival of President-elect Trump. But certainly Ukraine has always said that it would not do any deal unless Russia agreed to hand back the territory it took when it invaded. All right, Keir Simmons, thank you very much. We've got a lot more to come on this hour of Morning News Now, including one final farewell to One Direction's Liam Payne. As he's laid to rest today in England, you're looking at live pictures. He's surrounded by close friends, family, and all four of his former bandmates. First, though, after the break, a deadly blast decimating a home in one Ohio village. Look at these images. It killed two people and injured one other. The investigation now underway into what went wrong. That's next. Stay with us. Welcome back. A home in an Ohio village exploded and caught on fire Tuesday morning. The video is just incredible. It left two dead and a third injured. The blast destroyed the home in Bethel. That's a small village southeast of Cincinnati, sending debris across the neighborhood. The cause of the explosion is under investigation. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock joins us now with what we know so far. Hi, sure. Sam. Good morning. Savannah, good morning. Well, it's still not clear exactly what caused that blast. There were two of them, two different blasts in two different Midwest towns just yesterday, sending pieces of debris flying through neighborhoods and shaking homes all the way down the street just outside of Cincinnati. This is the one you were talking about, Savannah. Two people were killed, another injured. Then in a small township outside of Detroit, a late-night search for two people unaccounted for did end with news they're okay. They were not home at the time when their condo building went up in flames around dinner time. This morning, two communities reeling after major home explosions in the Midwest. Stunning video showing one blast near Cincinnati two dead, a man and a woman. So showing, they're advising the house is gone. And one injured, a witness describing that victim as a heating and air repairman, saying she saw him covered in soot at the scene. He's like bent over with his hands on his knees, like trying to get a breath and stuff. And uh, he's all dirt, like his face was dirty. And then I got closer, we were like, are you okay? And his whole hair was singed. Officials are still investigating the incident that sent shockwaves through that neighborhood. In the aftermath, fires burning and debris scattered. Also, a similar scene of devastation in a small township outside of Detroit, where at least four buildings were damaged after a blast in one home caused by gas, officials say. You see this blinding, flashing light, and then a, almost like a sonic boom. And then I saw that building going out and everything coming into the side of mine. Drone video reveals a major fire raging and emergency crews responding. As cleanup begins, and both communities recover after those dramatic home explosions. We'll help and work with the Sheriff's Department and the township as a whole in order to get some sort of relief effort put together for these people. Okay, so while the cause of that blast outside of Cincinnati is still under investigation, the building in that complex in Michigan is being called a potential gas explosion. More work to be done there. According to fire officials, two people in their 70s suffered critical injuries and are hospitalized. Savannah, we don't have an update on their conditions right now. Local churches, though, did open their doors for the roughly 20 people who are displaced. You always find out how communities come together, certainly in the midst of tragedy. This is another example. And something so frightening happening right in your neighborhood. My goodness. Good. Sam, thank you so much. Good. Infamous case that shocked the nation 30 years ago is back in the spotlight. Susan Smith is serving a life sentence for drowning her two children in a South Carolina lake. But today, for the first time, she's asking a parole board to release her from prison. In an NBC News exclusive, today anchor Craig Melvin spoke with her ex-husband, David Smith, who is now stepping forward to try and stop Susan from going free. It's October 1994, and a desperate search for two young boys has gripped the nation. I want to say to my babies <laughs> that your mama loves you so much. Their mother, Susan Smith, claims she's been carjacked and her sons, Michael and Alex, taken by a black man. The boy's father, David Smith, sticking by his wife's side, just like much of the country. 
But it's all a lie. After nine days of searching, Susan Smith confesses to buckling her boys into the family car and driving it into a lake. Susan Smith is convicted for their deaths and sentenced to 30 years in prison. Now, three decades later, Smith is up for parole. And for the first time since her trial, she will hear her ex-husband David speak out to oppose her release. Your ex-wife is going to face a parole board and you're going to be there. What do you plan to say? They can't let her out. For 30 years is just not enough. This wasn't an accident. She deliberately killed Michael and Alex. You don't think she's been rehabilitated? I don't think she'll ever be rehabilitated. To me, she's never even been really sorry for what she did. Susan Smith's incarceration has been troubled. In 2000, she was transferred to a new prison after having sex with two guards. She's also been disciplined for drug use. In 2015, she wrote to a local newspaper reporter saying, quote, I am not the monster society thinks I am. Something went very wrong that night. I was not myself. I was a good mother, and I loved my boys. I've never denied that she was a great mother up until the moment that she killed him. No signs. Like no signs never... that she would ever hurt them. That's why I believed her the whole nine days. I never doubted her. David's emotions turned dark during Susan's trial. As you sat there during the trial, what was going through your mind? I used to sit there and look at the back of her head and then look at where the bailiffs were and think about killing her. How quick could I get to her? Could I reach her before that officer reaches me? Yeah. You wanted her dead. I did. David Smith has remarried and is a father again, but he's never forgotten Michael and Alex. Usually it's a song that I hear. No, not any particular song, just different songs. And I, it just makes me remember how much I miss them. How I wish I could tell them. I miss you so much. <laughs> His anguish, he says, would be greater if Susan is released. If she does get paroled, do you worry that she's a, a threat to society? What scares me is that she would get out and then running into her somewhere. Why does that worry you? Because I don't want to see her. I don't ever want to have to face her. Craig, God gives us free will. And that was her choice that night. Nobody else's choice. Nobody made it for her. She made the choice to murder Michael and Alex. Have you forgiven her? Of course. Why? It doesn't make the pain any less. But I had to forgive her. And to move on with my life, I had to forgive her because it was just going to eat me up if I didn't. Our thanks to Craig Melvin for that report. NBC News reached out, but Susan Smith's attorney declined to comment on our story. Coming up, the very latest on the murder trial for the man accused of killing a nursing student, Lake and Riley, and the shocking new surveillance footage revealed in court showing Riley just moments before her untimely death. More on that up next. This morning, closing arguments are expected in the murder trial of the man accused of killing nursing student, Lake and Riley. And new surveillance footage revealed in court on Tuesday shows Riley on a jog just moments before she was killed on the University of Georgia campus in February. As the prosecution rested its case, the frantic last text she received from her mom were read aloud to the courtroom. Suspect Jose Antonio Ibarra pleaded not guilty to charges of murder and other crimes in Riley's killing. NBC News correspondent Priya Shreether is in Athens, Georgia with the latest. She's been following this since the beginning. Good morning, Priya. So let's talk about what was an emotional and a revealing day in court. What are some of the new details we heard? Just what were the big takeaways? Yeah, that's right, Joe. Well, about 30 or so of Lake and Riley's family members have been coming to the courthouse behind me every single day since this murder trial began. And yesterday was especially emotional for them. And that's because they got to take a look at this surveillance video that you guys are seeing right now showing Lake and Riley's 
final moments. She was, uh, this was all captured through University of Georgia surveillance cameras. And you can see her taking a jog. They also showed cameras from other vantage points that prosecutors say clearly show a man who they have identified as Jose Ibarra, the suspect in this case, kind of lurking around the area where Lake and Riley's body was eventually discovered. We also heard from the medical examiner yesterday who conducted the autopsy on Lake and Riley's, Riley's body. And she kind of outlined in somewhat graphic details exactly what happened to Lake and Riley. She said that the cause of death was blunt force trauma and as, asphyxiation, which could have been caused by being repeatedly bashed in the head with a rock and then also being suffocated. So as you can imagine, especially seeing that surveillance video. And then, as you mentioned, one of the witnesses also went through those final text messages between Lake and Riley and her mother. Lake and Riley allegedly texting her mother, Mom, I'm going out for a jog. You can give me a call. I'll be running for a little while. Her mom then repeatedly tried to call her, then started texting her saying, you're making me very worried since you're not answering the phone. Then going to the medical examiner testimony was just too much to bear, and many of her family members had to exit the courtroom because they were it was just too much. Mm, yes, absolutely heartbreaking. Um, Vara said that he won't be testifying in his own trial, but before closing arguments begin, we may hear from more defense witnesses today. That includes his brother, who's also in federal custody. What would he be expected to talk about? Yeah, you know what, Savannah, this one is especially interesting to a lot of folks who have been watching this trial extremely closely, and that's because one of the main strategies that the defense seems to be pursuing is kind of pointing the finger at Diego Ibarra, which is Jose's brother, who was also his roommate at the time. They're essentially trying to say that Diego Ibarra used to use Jose's cell phone a lot, and they even showed some social media accounts on Jose's phone that belonged to Diego. So they're saying that even though prosecutors are trying to say that Jose Ibarra's cell phone was pinging many cell phone towers around the area where Lake and Riley's body was discovered, that they can't definitively prove that it was Jose Ibarra himself who was holding that phone. Now, yesterday we did hear from two witnesses that the defense put forward. One was a University of Georgia student runner who was around that area and said that he did see a man lurking around that area, but that man was actually taller and thinner than Jose Ibarra himself. So it'll be interesting to see if Diego does take the stand what exactly it is that the defense wants him to say since they seem to be trying to pin all of this on him. Hmm. All right, Priya Shreether, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Let's turn now to a story that's impacting our parent company, Comcast, this morning. Comcast announced its intention to spin off its cable networks into a new publicly traded company comprised of some of NBC Universal's best known brands like MSNBC, E and CNBC. Comcast had announced on its quarterly call in late October that it was considering this venture. This all comes at a time when those brands are facing the same cost cutting challenges as many other cable networks and the media at large. NBC News business and data correspondent Brian Chung joins us now with more. Brian, we will just be transparent and say we all have a lot of yes, questions. We do. As yeah. people who work here, but what do we know at this point? And tell us um, kind of what it means for the networks that we mentioned that would be in this spinoff. Yes, yeah, so you mentioned MSNBC, CNBC, and also E but I want to add that it also includes Sci-Fi, the Golf Channel, uh, Oxygen, USA as well. Those brands would be spun off into a separate company. It would be a separate publicly traded company that has its own stock symbol. Current shareholders of Comcast would remain uh, hold holders of Comcast, but they would also get shares in this new company. Uh, but again, basically the idea here is that they're going to be two separate companies. They would have a complete corporate silo, uh, but there could be some licensing agreements or maybe even some newsroom sharing between uh, the two companies. That remains an open question, uh, regardless the company says that this is going to take about a year to complete. Uh, so it's definitely a lot of questions up in the air uh, at this time. And then some folks stay put, right? Who, who doesn't move to this new company? Yeah, so in the Comcast, NBC Universal company, uh, you're going to have NBC News, which is us. You have uh, Universal Studios as well as the Universal theme parks. Uh, NBC Sports is going to stay as part of that. And Bravo, Bravo is kind of the one cable network exception that's not going to be part of this spin company. Uh, it's going to remain as part of the NBC properties. But I want to point out that the uh, uh, president of Comcast, Mike Cavanaugh, he said that the idea here is to, quote, play offense in a complex and evolving media landscape. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of change that's been happening. A lot of companies that have been selling cable assets. You rewind to uh, 2022 when AT&T sold off their Time Warner assets in the form of Warner Media that got bought up by Discovery. There's a lot of moving parts here, and I imagine this is kind of part of the strategy as well. 
We just can't let go of those housewives. That's right. <laughs> yeah. It's quite well, keep going. Imagine. Imagine. They'll, They'll be anchoring the news soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, we'll, see about, we'll see about that. <laughs> um, Brian, for viewers at home, will they notice anything? I mean, for people who... Uh, actually, a lot of people don't even know, I think, that those brands are related to us. At least yeah. I, I experience that when I tell somebody, oh, for you sure. know, he's part of NBC, same family that we're in. But will viewers at home notice anything? Yeah, well, I mean, again, I think the way that most people are consuming things right now is through Peacock, which right. Peacock will remain part of Comcast cast but again because these companies are now getting spun off like sci-fi and e like if you want sci-fi or e content on peacock there might have to be some sort of agreement uh the licensing between the spin co and then with comcast that remains to be seen and it'll probably be details that'll be worked out over the next year uh but again you probably should expect to see at least in the interim no change to what you're seeing on peacock you'll still be able to get your msnbc nbc but also some of those cable network uh properties as well like the housewives Right. Brian, keep us posted. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. We're the ones with all the questions on this right now. All right, coming up, we are reaching for the sky. Oh, yeah, great. After the break, our death defying ascent. <laughs> for me, it was nearly a thousand feet above the streets of New York on Rockefeller Center's thrilling new attraction for visitors from around the world. Stick around, that's up next. Welcome back with your Thanksgiving feast just eight days away. It's time to start thinking about heading to the supermarket for all your festive favorites. Or make a reservation. The new numbers are out this morning, <laughs> and they could give you a better idea of just how much of a bite the turkey and trimmings will take out of your budget this year. For more, let's bring in NBC News senior business correspondent Christine Romans. Christine, good morning. I make a reservation at Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Um, Table for five? <laughs> um, okay. Uh, see, for me, also, I have questions about, like, how soon is too soon for the turkey, and then do you freeze it, and, like, eh, which is You're not what answer you're here for. Right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> what should we expect to spend this year? A little bit less, uh, okay. about 5% about less overall for the meal. And this is the American Farm Bureau that goes out there. They go oh, around the country, 580 per person. Now, this, is what they, this is what they measure, turkey, the stuffing, so the cubed dry yeah, stuffing. Like in a box. Um, sweet potatoes, rolls, frozen peas, uh, fresh cranberries, celery, carrots, uh, pie, apple pie crust, or I'm sorry, pumpkin pie mix, the crust, whipping cream, and whole milk. Okay, well, and they're these, missing the mashed I, potatoes. That, that, I know. If you add the mashed potatoes and put some um, <laughs> ham in there, then it's like $71 or $7 okay. per person. But these are how those prices are changing this year. So it's going to be a little bit less than, than last year, and that's great news. Mm -hmm. um, and still, though, it's more than 2019 overall. Right, and so because that is good news, but we still want to save more, what are some other things you can do to so save? So there are some big offers out there. Amazon Fresh, Aldi, Walmart, Target. Um, Walmart is having what it's calling the inflation-free Thanksgiving. Uh, Aldi has a $47 meal for 10 people. Target has a $20 meal for four people. Now, each of these has a different bunch of kind of ingredients. You might have to right. buy some other stuff. Some of the warehouse stores are still offering like a free turkey if you buy a certain amount of other groceries. And then the experts tell us if you buy the store brands, if you're very, very pointed about buying store brands, you can shave another up to $17 off the cost of the meal. So that's good news for people who are kind of out there really shopping savvy. Usually what happens to me is I go and I just get it, and then I'm like, wow, that was really expensive because I'm just right. in a hurry trying to get all the stuff yeah, together. Totally. Or I'm like the one with there's one turkey left to pick from. I'm like, great, guess that's mine. But are you like some some people like their heirloom heritage turkeys? And they're, those can be really expensive. My the mom fresh this ones year is all about farmers hormone market. free, and she keeps calling right. me asking me to order one. Yeah, the really yeah, cheap frozen like, okay. ones. I don't know what's in them. They taste good and they're yeah. cheap. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, also, there was something that just happened recently that I know was it was kind of startling to see because of the way it impacted some grocery stores. A cyber attack, and there were even empty shelves. Yeah. There was so, and it was so fascinating because it was this cybersecurity incident for this company. And so you had some Stop and Shops and some Hannafords in the Northwest, in the Northeast, uh, those grocery stores that had uh, basically spare shelves, uh, skimpy shelves in some areas. They had to, what well, the company said they had to do, they had to like sort of shut down some processes, which included, you know, ordering. And so they didn't have all of their stuff. But this is what you can do. The FBI says the holidays is the biggest time when, when these kinds of cyber attacks oh. are happening on the places you need. Don't click on links from unknown senders. Check for spelling errors on any sites that you're using for shopping. They're saying the holiday shopping season is really a time when, especially if you're online shopping, they're trying to get you to uh, make purchases um, with a credit card online that you you know you know and you trust. Sure. And um, be super careful. Don't use public Wi-Fi to make um, to make purchases. Oh, I have heard that, and I think I do that. All right, Chris, don't do that. Don't, don't, don't do that. So much to think about this morning. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> now to a brand new view of New York City that you can get right here at 30 Rock. Yeah, that's right. Our friends at Rockefeller Center's iconic top of the 
Rock have opened up a new attraction to elevate the experience, literally. It is called Skylift. It's an open-air revolving platform that ascends three stories above the building's top floor. That's the 70th floor, by the way, offering a spectacular 360-degree view of the city. Okay, so I didn't actually think I was as scared of heights as I apparently am. So when we got the invite to go, we couldn't say no. We went all the way up, but I didn't love it to see the view for ourselves. A few weeks ago, we did Jimmy Fallon's to Nightmares, a haunted house. Oh, you were good. Where I was thrilled. I was scared. I feel like this might be different. So this is a complete opposite. We are having a reversal going on. I'm really scared. I'm scared. <laughs> I'm fine. I don't mind heights. So let's see how this goes. Yeah, this time I'll <laughs> this be the one holding on to you. <laughs> All right. It just really looks so high. I have a feeling I will be clinging to that. Well, let's find out. Let's go. It's like rendering a spaceship or something, right? <laughs> You're really clinging on, aren't you? Really scared. See, it's going slow. Slow. Very slow. It's the kind of the speed of it. It's just about the part. Right. Oh, the toe turning. The turning. It's, yeah. not. it's turning like your stuff. Love things that spin even when they're at ground level. <laughs> kind of fun. It is like a ride. So much fun. Is it getting better or worse? I think it's getting worse. Well, Jewel, it really is really, really high. It's high? Oh, I'm down. Look out. I can't, we can't believe how scared I'm scared. Look at my palm, it's like sweating. Has anyone ever broken this? <laughs> Time to take your special Skylift photo and video. Oh no. Where do I have to stand? Where do we go? Stand right here. Right here? Yep. All right. Yeah. You got it? Don't <laughs> 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 look down. <laughs> Or up. <laughs> oh my God, I didn't even think of looking up. That does sound scary. And it's just up. Okay. Yeah, just out. Right, back to home base. It's just... <laughs> my dog. <laughs> Do you do roller coaster? I love a roller coaster. Love. Okay. But that's like more action. I don't know. I don't know. Do you know what I mean? I know what you mean. You know, like, the big, the big ones that go straight up and down? Yeah, I like... I can't do... Oh, that I don't like... Me. Well, I don't know. It's like because I'm there for a thrill ride. Right now, I'm like, this is... What if this unexpectedly became more thrilling? So we got Central Park right there. We're going to into... It's Times Square. Look at that. You can see the ball. There you go. We can see the square. This is glamorous. Lots of Joe with a skyline. And here's me. <laughs> Oh, and now we're making our way down. See, didn't even notice. We're slowly making our way down. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and back she goes. Okay, that is scary. I mean, it makes you a little weak in the knees, no? You feel not better or you feel not? I'm fine with this. We did it. We survived. We survived? Sweating? So you went in scared. And I left thrilled to be back <laughs> on the 70th on floor. On the 70th floor. <laughs> You're my hero. You're fine with this. I genuinely could not have done that without you. But come to 30 Rock and you'll want it. <laughs> Fantastic advertisement. <laughs> I enjoyed it. It was very fun. It was a cool way to see things a little bit higher up. So, so cool. Our friends at Rock Center say Skyloft is the final piece of the iconic building's revitalization project, which includes new restaurants and experiences for tourists and locals alike. It's been awesome for us. Tickets to the new Skyloft experience are now on sale. Really? That. Gorgeous. Yeah. Like riding a roller coaster yeah, and check out the tree. It's so thrilling. All right, coming up, it's your front row seat to the very best of Broadway and beyond. After the break, our curtain call featuring one of the hottest tickets in town swept away. It's inspiration, it's moving soundtrack, brought to you by some familiar faces to music lovers all over the world, the Avid Brothers. I'm going to be chatting with Scott and Seth about the show's Stranger Than Fiction premise that is coming up next. Welcome back. This piece of news is getting me very excited. Take a look at this. That's live pictures, live footage of the tree right outside of 30 Rock. As you can see, she's getting all dolled up for her big night because the official tree lighting is just two weeks from today. And the lineup 
for our special. It's looking merry and bright. Kelly Clarkson is hosting for the second year in a row. And artists like Coco Jones, Jennifer Hudson, and the Backstreet Boys are coming to help us deck the halls. The Radio City Rockettes will, of course, also be dropping by to help high kick us into Christmas gear. And we hope you'll join us, too. The Christmas at Rockefeller Center special airs on December 4th at 8 p.m. on NBC and Peacock. You know that's a story I love, Joe. I'm looking forward to that. It's a beautiful tree, too. Can't wait to see it all lit up. All right, let's end this hour with a curtain call, your front row ticket to the hottest shows on Broadway and beyond. This morning, we're getting a look at Swept Away, a new Broadway musical about a shipwreck in the 1880s. The show finally had its big debut opening last night. Well, Broadway shows about boating disasters maybe aren't new. Think Titanic the musical. This one's definitely grabbing headlines for its stranger than fiction storyline, its haunting music, and also these guys who are joining me now this morning, the musicians who didn't just write the songs, they were also the inspiration for the show, the Avid brothers, Scott and Seth. Congratulations. I know you guys were probably up late last night with the big opening. This show is getting fantastic reviews. New York Times critics pick, so it, it, you must be incredibly excited about everything that's happening here. We are very excited. <laughs> this is amazing. It let's really let's is. start with how this started, because, Scott, what you were reading a book, what, like 20 years ago, about yeah. this story, about the Mignonetta, yacht yeah. which capsized, and the crew is, what, trapped for 19 days at sea. What was it about this that made you go, Let's make an album about this story. Well, uh, um, we were young men in a van, <laughs> traveling the country, trying to- You're saying uh, you could relate. <laughs> share our songs, and we thought this van is a lot like a ship. And uh, no, but the, what struck us about the story, well, we would share what we were reading with each other. We had a lot of time to kill, waiting for, for gigs, and uh, we had a lot of time to uh, share what we were reading. The aspect of truth in this story, what you do with the truth, and, and in the in the story swept away, you'll see uh, how do you tell your story? How do you tell it uh, uh, authentically, sincerely, uh, in the in the uh, the good and the bad of it? That struck us, and we were we were we were feeling that, and we uh, wanted to share that with the world. So you told that story through an album, and then Seth, what like ten years ago, you hear from a Broadway musical producer who says. Let's maybe put this on Broadway. I mean, what did you think when you got that call? Well, we thought, uh, because I guess we had seen that record as we made it, we, we saw it in our minds. We saw the imagery of it. Though, of course, we didn't have the resources to, to, to bring that to life in such a, a big, uh, vivid fashion. But uh, in, on one hand, we were surprised and excited. And on the other hand, we were just like, of course. Mm -hmm. This makes so much sense. And that was really just the first of many very natural steps where the pieces just came together and kept coming together and kept coming together, culminating in last night. And you've learned Broadway is a process. It takes time to make all these things happen. Man, what has that experience been like for you guys? Well, it has been a long, I mean, it's been, like you said, 10 years. Uh, for us, we've been fortunate to be practiced in the letting go of, the holding loosely of our creations mm -hmm. when we're making work to allow for the community of the producers and directors, actors and writers in our world as well as this to do their best. And when we when we can let go of the ownership a little bit and, and share in it, in yeah. the community that's making it, it does take time, but the the the, the finished product is elevated. Well, let's and be so. clear. This is not an easy story to tell no. or to watch. You got four people who are trapped at sea and they have to make a choice. And I yeah. won't give too much more away than that. What are the things you hope people can take away from this story? Oh, man, well, that's a big question. I, I think the story touches on a lot of very big topics, and I think each of the four main characters are very relatable. I think that, that each of us can see ourselves in each one, though drastically different they are. Um, and I think it's, there's something very beautiful in, in taking inventory through of your own life through a, a, a kind of a dark consideration. The first time you saw it was with your wife. Was that in D.C.? Is that it right? It was, yeah, that's What correct. was that like for you and for her? What was her reaction? Uh, I, I don't know. I know her, her reaction afterward was that, I guess she watched me a lot of the time watching it, and uh, she said she had never seen me smile like that. And for me, I, you know, the entire 90-minute uh, uh, performance felt like it was just a few minutes. I felt like I was floating. It was just, it's a very odd experience to have this material that you know that I see as as um, you know autobiographical lyrical content of Scott and I like our lives to see the jigsaw 
puzzle of that taken apart and then put back together and to create a completely new image is what it felt like, you know. But it was it was just surreal to put it put it in a word. All right, so now you, you've got this. It's getting going here. Do you think you could do something Broadway related again, uh, <laughs> or are you gonna are you gonna hold off for a little bit? Well, this happened so <laughs> sincere. This this happened to us. We didn't we didn't set out to uh, to make a Broadway show. Um, we've just been committed to our craft, which has been songwriting uh, in this in this case, and uh, I think other people came to uh, to join in on that because we relate, and uh, we'll let whatever happens happens next. Yeah, and we we certainly feel welcome now. Which yeah, is, which for is, sure, which is incredible. We have sure. so many fans who are going to be introduced to Broadway, and many Broadway people who are going to be introduced yeah. to you now. I love yeah. this story so much, the Avid Brothers. Thank, thank you so much for joining me. Congrats thank you. on everything. Thank you. That is going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.